Welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the first of our new university's lectures titled Journeys, lectures in which members of our community will share with us reflections and insights on their personal and professional journeys. Today's Journeys lecture, as you all know, is by Professor Randy Pausch. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start by um, covering Randy's academic credentials. Um, it's a little bizarre for me to be standing here at Carnegie Mellon, which is a, a school I couldn't get into, uh, <laughs> no matter how much uh, I contributed to this institution. But <laughs> no, really, I'm not kidding. <laughs> You all think, oh gosh, he's humble. Really, no, I'm not humble at all. Uh, very average SAT scores, you know, right in the middle of my high school class of 900. Anyway, Randy, Randy earned. It really pisses me off that Randy's so smart. As if you want to Actually, I called him. We decided about, what, four weeks ago when he, we heard the news went from, you know, like bad to horrific. It was on a Wednesday night, and I said, look, we have two choices. We can like, play this really straight and very emotional, or we can go to dark humor. And for those of you who know Randy well, he was like, oh, pff, dark humor. <laughs> so I called him the next day and I was like, dude, you can't die. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, when you die, the average IQ of Seabolt's friends is going to like drop 50 points. <laughs> to which he responded, we need to find you some smarter friends. <laughs> so you're all smart because you're here. So if you want to be my friend, I'll be over the corner of the reception room. Randy earned his undergraduate degree in computer science at Brown in 1982, his PhD in CS from Carnegie Mellon in 1988, and taught at the University of Virginia, where he was granted tenure a year early. He joined the Carnegie Mellon faculty in 1997 with appointments in the CS, HCI, and design departments. He has authored or co-authored five books and over 60 reviewed journal and conference preceding articles, none of which I would understand. We spent an enormous amount of time together. Um, we taught each other about each other's very uh, interesting, strange cultures to the other, academic versus the corporate world. And we developed a deep friendship woven together with stories about our kids, our wives, our parents, as well as deep discussions about the paramount importance of integrity in everything you do, family first, religion, our shared joy in connecting people and ideas, in deploying money and influence to do good, and the importance of having a lot of laughs along the way. Randy's dedication to making the world a better place is self-evident to anyone who has crossed paths with him. Whether it's directly influencing students, crea creating organizations like the ETC, building tools like Alice, or doing what he probably does best, which is bridging cultures. As Bing Gordon, EA's chief creative officer, says of Randy, even more important than Randy's academic, philanthropic, and entrepreneurial accomplishments has been his humanity and the enthusiasm he brings to students and coworkers on a daily basis. For those of you who know Randy, Randy brings a particular zest for life and humor, even while facing death. To Randy, this is simply another adventure. It is my great honor to introduce Dylan, Logan, and Chloe's dad, Jay's husband, and my very dear friend, Dr. Randy Pausch. to be here. Um, uh, what Indira didn't tell you is that this lecture series used to be called The Last Lecture. If you had one last lecture to give before you died, what would it be? I thought, damn, I finally nailed the venue and they renamed it. <laughs> so, um, you know, in case there's anybody who wandered in and doesn't know the backstory, my dad always taught me when there's an elephant in the room, introduce them. Uh, if you look at my CAT scans, there are approximately 10 tumors in my liver, and the doctors told me three to six months of good health left. Uh, that was a month ago, so you can do the math. 
Um, I have some of the best doctors in the world. And you the microphone's not working? Then I'll just have to talk louder. All right. Is that good? All right. Uh, so that is what it is. We can't change it. And we just have to decide how we're going to respond to that. We cannot change the cards we are dealt, just how we play the hand. All right, so what we're we not talking about today, we're not talking about cancer, because I spent a lot of time talking about that, and I'm really not interested. If you have any herbal supplements or remedies, please stay away from me. Uh, and we're not going to talk about things that are even more important than achieving your childhood dreams. We're not going to talk about my wife, we're not going to talk about my kids, because I'm good, but I'm not good enough to talk about that without tearing up. So we're just going to take that off the table. That's much more important. And we're not going to talk about spirituality and religion. Um, Although I will tell you that I have experienced a deathbed conversion. Um, I just bought a Macintosh. <laughs> now, I knew I'd get 9% of the audience with that. But... <laughs> All right, so what is today's talk about then? It's about my childhood dreams and how I've achieved them. I've been very fortunate that way. How I believe I've been able to enable the dreams, I've been able to enable the dreams of others. And to some degree, lessons learned. I'm a professor, there should be some lessons learned. And how you can use the stuff you hear today to achieve your dreams or enable the dreams of others. And as you get older, you may find that enabling the dreams of others thing is even more fun. So what were my childhood dreams? Well, you know, I had a really good childhood. I mean, no kidding around. So what were my childhood dreams? You may not agree with this list, but <laughs> I was there. Uh, <laughs> being in zero gravity, playing in the National Football League, uh, authoring an article in the World Book Encyclopedia. I guess you can tell the nerds early. Um, <laughs> uh, being Captain Kirk. Uh, anybody here have that childhood dream? <laughs> not at CMU, no. Um, I wanted to become one of the guys who won the big stuffed animals in the amusement park, and I wanted to be an Imagineer with Disney. Right? These are not sorted in any particular order, although I think they do get harder, except for maybe the first one. Um, OK, so being in zero gravity. Now, it's important to have specific dreams. I did not dream of being an astronaut, because when I was a little kid, I wore glasses. And they told me, oh, astronauts can't have glasses. And I was like, mm, I didn't really want the whole astronaut gig. I just wanted the floating. So, uh, and as a child, <laughs> prototype 0.0. .0. Uh, but that didn't work so well. And uh, it turns out that NASA has uh, something called the Vomit Comet that they use to train the astronauts. And this thing does parabolic arcs. And at the top of each arc, you get about 25 seconds where you're ballistic and you get about you know, a rough equivalent of weightlessness for about 25 seconds. And there is a program where college students can submit proposals. And if they win the competition, they get to fly. And I thought that was really cool. And we had a team, and we put a team together. And they won, and they got to fly. And I was all excited, because I was going to go with them. And then I fit the first brick wall, because they made it very clear that under no circumstances were faculty members allowed to fly with the teams. I know, I was heartbroken. Right. I was like, but I worked so hard. <laughs> uh, and so I read the literature very carefully, and it turns out that NASA it's part of their outreach and publicity program. And it turns out that the students were allowed to bring a local media journalist from their hometown. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Randy Pelsch, web journalist. Uh, it's really easy to get a press pass. So, uh, so I called up the guys at NASA and I said, um, I need to know where to fax some documents. And they said, uh, what documents are you going to fax us? I said, my resignation as the uh, faculty advisor and my application as the journalist. <laughs> and he said, that's a little transparent, don't you think? <laughs> and I said, yeah, but our project is virtual reality, and we're going to bring down a whole bunch of VR headsets, and all the students from all the teams are going to experience it, and all those other real journalists are going to get to film it. <laughs> Jim Foley's going, ah, oh, you bastard, yes. Uh, and the guy said, here's the fax number. So. <laughs> And indeed, we kept our end of the bargain. Uh, and that's one of the themes that you'll hear later on in the talk, is have something to bring to the table, right? because that will make you more welcomed. Uh, and if you're curious about what zero gravity looks like, uh, hopefully the sound will be working here. All right, go get him, Mazi. 
This is fantastic. It's just amazing. It's nothing like I expected. We're having a great Here time. Here I am. I don't think any of us have <laughs> bad on this so far. This is awesome. <laughs> ah! You got one, Mozzie. That's good. <laughs> you, you do pay the piper at the bottom. <laughs> so, childhood dream number one? Check. All right, let's talk about football. My dream was to play in the National Football League. And most of you don't know that I actually play, no. Um, <laughs> no, I did not make it to the National Football League. But I probably got more from that dream and not accomplishing it than I got from any of the ones that I did accomplish. Um, I, I had a coach. I signed up when I was nine years old. I was the, the smallest kid in the league by far. And I had a coach, Jim Graham, who was six foot four. He had played linebacker at Penn State. He was just this hulk of a guy. And he was old school. Okay, I mean really old school. Like he thought the forward pass was a trick play. <laughs> so, and he showed up for practice the first day, and you know, he's this big hulking guy. We were all scared to death of him, and he hadn't brought any footballs. How, how are we going to have practice without any footballs? And one of the other kids said, excuse me, coach, but there's no football. And Coach Graham said, right, how many men are on a football field at a time? Or is it 11 on a team? 22. And Coach Graham said, all right, and how many people are touching the football at any given time? Well, one of them. And he said, right, so we're going to work on what those other 21 guys are doing. <laughs> and that's a really good story because it's all about fundamentals. Fundamentals, fundamentals, fundamentals. You've got to get the fundamentals down because otherwise the fancy stuff isn't going to work. And the other Jim Graham story I have is there was one practice where he just rode me, all practice. Just, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, go back and do it again, you owe me, you're doing push-ups after practice. And when it was all over, one of the other assistant coaches came over and said, yeah, Coach Graham rode you pretty hard, didn't he? I said, yeah, he said, that's a good thing. He said, when you're screwing up and nobody's saying anything to you anymore, that means they gave up. And that's a lesson that stuck with me my whole life, is that when you see, when you see yourself doing something badly and nobody's bothering to tell you anymore, that's a very bad place to be. Your critics are your ones telling you they still love you and care. Uh, after Coach Graham, I had another coach, Coach Setliff, and he taught me a lot about the power of enthusiasm. He did this one thing where only for one play at a time, he would put people in at like the most horrifically wrong position for them. Like all the short guys would become receivers, right? It was, just, it was just laughable. But we only went in for one play, right? And boy, the other team just never knew what hit them. Because when, <laughs> when you're only doing it for one play and you're just not where you're supposed to be, and freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, boy, are you gonna clean somebody's clock for that one play. <laughs> And, and that kind of enthusiasm was great. And to this day, I am most comfortable on a football field. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, if I'm working a hard problem, people will see me wandering the halls with one of these things. And that's just because, you know, when you do something young enough and you train for it, it just becomes a part of you. And I'm very glad that football was a part of my life. And if I didn't get the dream of playing in the NFL, that's okay. I probably got stuff more valuable. Because looking at what's going on in the NFL, I'm not sure those guys are doing so great right now. <laughs> OK? And so one of the expressions I learned in electronic arts, which I love, which pertains to this, is experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And I, I think that's absolutely lovely. Um, and the other thing about football is we send our kids out to play football or soccer or swimming or whatever it is. And it's the first example of what I'm going to call a head fake or indirect learning. We actually don't want our kids to learn football. I mean, yeah, it's really nice that I have a wonderful three-point stance and that I know how to do a chop block and all this kind of stuff. But we send our kids out to learn much more important things, teamwork, sportsmanship, perseverance, et cetera, et cetera. And these kinds of head fake learnings are absolutely important. And you should keep your eye out for them because they're everywhere. All right, a simple one, being an author in the World Book Encyclopedia. When I was a kid, we had the World Book Encyclopedia on the shelf. Uh, for the freshmen, this is paper. <laughs> we used to have these things called books. Um, and after I had become somewhat of an authority on virtual reality, but not like a really important one, so I was at the level of people the World Book would badger, uh, they called me up and I wrote an article, and uh, this is Caitlin Kelleher, and uh, there's an article, if you go to your local library where they still have copies of the World Book, look under V for virtual reality, and there it is. 
And all I have to say is that um, having been selected to be an author in, in the World Book Encyclopedia, I now believe that Wikipedia is a perfectly fine source for your information because <laughs> I know what the quality control is for real encyclopedias. They let me in. Uh, all right, next one. Uh, <laughs> at, at a certain point, you just realize there's some things you're not going to do, so maybe you just want to stand close to the people. And uh, uh, I mean, my God, what a, what a role model for young people. Right? <laughs> I mean, just this is everything you want to be. And what I, what I learned that carried me forward in leadership later is that you know, he wasn't the smartest guy on the ship. I mean, Spock was pretty smart, and McCoy was the doctor, and Scotty was the engineer, and you sort of go, and what skill set did he have to get on this damn thing and run it? And, you know, clearly there's this skill set called leadership. And, you know, whether or not you like the series, there's no doubt that there was a lot to be learned about how to lead people by watching this guy in action. So, and he just had the coolest damn toys. <laughs> right? I mean, my God, he, uh... You know, I, I just thought it was fascinating as a kid that he had this thing and he could, you know, talk to the ship with it. Right? <laughs> you know, I, I just thought that was just spectacular. And of course, now I own one and it's smaller. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Uh, so I got to achieve this dream. Uh, James T. Kirk, his alter ego. Um, uh, William Shatner wrote a book, which I think was actually a pretty cool book. Uh, it was with uh, Chip Walter, who is uh, a, a Pittsburgh-based author who's quite good. And they wrote a book on basically the science of Star Trek, you know, what has come true. And they went around to top places around the country and looked at various things, and they came here to study our virtual reality setup. And uh, so we built a virtual reality for him. It looked something like that. Um, we put it in, put it to red alert. He was a very good sport. It's not like he saw that one coming. <laughs> And it's really cool to meet your boyhood idol. But it's even cooler when he comes to you to see what cool stuff you're doing in your lab. All right, my next one, being an Imagineer. This was the hard one. Uh, believe me, getting to zero gravity is easier than becoming an Imagineer. Uh, when I was a kid, I was eight years old, and our family took a trip cross country to see Disneyland. And if you've ever seen the movie National Lampoon's Vacation, it was a lot like that. <laughs> it was a quest. And uh, these are real vintage photographs. Uh, and there I am in front of the castle. And there I am. And for those of you who are into foreshadowing, this is the Alice ride. <laughs> and, and I just thought this was just the coolest coolest environment I'd ever been in. And instead of saying, gee, I want to experience this, I said, I want to make stuff like this. And so I, I bided my time. And then I graduated with my PhD from Carnegie Mellon, thinking that meant me infinitely qualified to do anything. And I dashed off my letters of application to Walt Disney Imagineering. And they sent me some of the damn nicest go to hell letters I've ever gotten. Uh, I mean, it was just, uh, we have carefully reviewed your application, and presently we do not have any positions available which require your particular qualifications. <laughs> now think about the fact that you're getting this from a place that's famous for guys who sweep the street. Right? <laughs> so that was a bit of a setback. But remember, the brick walls are there for a reason. Right? The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. Because the brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. They're there to stop the other people. <laughs> All right, fast forward to 1991. We did a system back at the University of Virginia called Virtual Reality on $5 a day. Uh, just one of those unbelievable, spectacular things. I was so scared back in those days as a junior academic. Uh, Jim Foley's here, and I just love to tell this story. Uh, he knew my undergraduate advisor, Andy Van Dam, and I'm at my first conference, and I'm just scared to death. And this, this icon in the user interface community walks up to me and just out of nowhere just gives me this huge bear hug, and he says, that was from Andy. <laughs> and that was when I thought, okay, maybe I can make it, all right? You know, maybe, maybe I do belong. Uh, and a similar story is that this was just this unbelievable hit because at the time everybody needed a half a million dollars to do virtual reality and everybody felt frustrated and we literally hacked together a system for about $5,000 in parts 
and made a working VR system. And people were just like, oh my god, it's like you know, the Hewlett Packard garage thing. This is so awesome. And so I'm giving this talk, and the room has just gone wild. And during the Q&A, a guy named Tom Furness, who was one of the big names in virtual reality at the time, he goes up to the microphone and he introduces himself. And I didn't know what he looked like, but I sure as hell knew the name. And he, and he asked a question. And I was like, I'm sorry, did you say you're Tom Furness? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, then I would love to answer your question, but first, will you have lunch with me tomorrow? <laughs> And, and there's a lot in that little moment, right? There's a lot of humility, but also asking a person where he can't possibly say no. Uh, and so Imagineering, a couple of years later, was working on a virtual reality project. This was top secret. They were denying the existence of a virtual reality attraction after the time that the publicity department was running the TV commercials. Okay, so Imagineering really had nailed this one tight. And uh, it was the Aladdin attraction where you would fly a magic carpet. And the head-mounted display, sometimes known as Gator Vision. Uh, and so I had an in. As soon as the, the, the project had just, you know, they started running the TV commercials. And I had been asked to brief the Secretary of Defense on the state of virtual reality. Okay, Fred Brooks and I uh, had been asked to brief the Secretary of Defense. And... Uh, that gave me an excuse. So I, I called them up, I called Imagineering, and I said, look, I'm briefing the Secretary of Defense. I'd like some materials on what you have, because it's one of the best VR systems in the world. And they kind of pushed back, and I said, look, is all this patriotism stuff in the parks a farce? And they're like, hmm, OK. Uh, <laughs> they said, but the, but the PR department doesn't have, this is so new, the PR department doesn't have any footage for you, so I'm going to have to connect you straight through to the team who did the work. Jackpot. Right? <laughs> So I find myself on the phone with a guy named John Snotty, who is one of the most impressive guys I have ever met. And he was the guy running this team. And it's not surprising they had done impressive things. And uh, so he sent me some stuff. We talked briefly. He sent me some stuff. And I said, hey, I'm going to be out in the area for a conference shortly. Would you like to get together and have lunch? <laughs> Translation, I'm going to lie to you and say that I have an excuse to be in the area so I don't look too anxious. But I would go to Neptune to have lunch with you. <laughs> Uh, and so John said, sure. And uh, I spent something like 80 hours talking with all the VR experts in the world, saying, if you had access to this one unbelievable project, what would you ask? And then I compiled all of that, and I had to memorize it, which anybody who knows me knows that I have no memory at all, because I couldn't go in looking like a dweeb with, you know, hi, question 72. Right? <laughs> so I went in. And this was like a two-hour lunch. And John must have thought he was talking to you know, some phenomenal person, because all I was, do was doing was channeling Fred Brooks and Ivan Sutherland and Andy Van Dam and people like that, and Henry Fuchs. So it's pretty easy to be smart when you're parroting smart people. Uh, and at the end of the lunch with John, I sort of, as we say in the business, made the ask. And I said, you know, I have a sabbatical coming up. And he said, what's that? <laughs> The beginnings of the culture clash. Uh, and so I talked to him about the possibility of coming there and working with him. And uh, he, uh, he said, well, that's really good, except you know, you're in the business of telling people stuff, and we're in the business of keeping secrets. Right? And then what made John Snotty John Snotty was he said, but we'll work it out, right? which I really love. The other thing that I learned from John Snotty, I could do a, easily an hour-long talk just on what have I learned from John Snotty. One of the things he told me was that, Wait long enough, and people will surprise and impress you. He said, when you're pissed off at somebody and you're angry at them, you just haven't given them enough time. Just give them a little more time, and they'll almost always impress you. And that really stuck with me. I think he's absolutely right on that one. Uh, so uh, to make a long story short, we negotiated uh, a legal contract. It was going to be the first, some people refer to it as the first and last paper ever published by Imagineering. But the deal was, I go, I, I provide my own funding, I go for six months, I work with a project, we publish a paper. Um, so I worked on the Aladdin project. It was absolutely spectacular. I mean, just unbelievable. Uh, here's my nephew Christopher. This was the apparatus. You would sit on this sort of motorcycle type thing, and you would steer your magic carpet, and you would put on the head-mounted display. The head-mounted display was very interesting. It had two parts, and it was a very, very clever design. To get throughput through, the only part that touched the guest's head was this little cap, and everything else clicked onto it, all the expensive hardware. So you could replicate the caps, because they were basically free to manufacture. Uh, and th this is what I really did, as I was a cap cleaner during this event. <laughs> uh, 
uh, I loved Imagineering. It was just a spectacular place, just spectacular. Everything that I had dreamed. Uh, I love the model shop, people crawling around on things the size of this room that are just big physical models. Uh, it was just an incredible place to walk around and be inspired. Uh, I'm always reminded of when I went there and people said, do you think the expectations are too high? And I said, you ever see the movie Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where Gene Wilder says to the little boy Charlie, he's about to give him the Chocolate Factory, he says, well, Charlie, did anybody ever tell you the story of the little boy who suddenly got everything he ever wanted? Charlie's eyes get like saucers and he says, no, what happened to him? Gene Wilder says, he lived happily ever after. <laughs> Okay, so working on the Aladdin VR, I described it as a once in every five years opportunity, and I stand by that assessment. Uh, it, it forever changed me. It wasn't just that it was good work and I got to be a part of it, uh, but it got me into the place of working with real people and real HCI user interface issues. Most HCI people live in this fantasy world of white collar laborers with PhDs and master's degrees, and you know, until you got ice cream spilled on you, you're not doing field work, right? Uh, and more, any, more than anything else from John Snotty, I learned how to put artists and engineers together. And that's been the real legacy. Uh, we published a paper, uh, just a nice academic cultural scandal. When we wrote the paper, the guys at Imagineering said, well, let's do a nice big picture, <laughs> like, like you would in a magazine. And the SIGGRAPH committee, which accepted the paper, it was like this big scandal. Are they allowed to do that? <laughs> there was no rule. So we published the paper, and uh, amazingly, since then, there's a tradition of SIGGRAPH papers having colored figures on the first page. I, so I, I've, I've changed the world in a small way. Um, <laughs> and then at the end of my six months, they came to me and they said, you want to do it for real? You can stay. <laughs> and I said no. Uh, one of the only times in my life I have surprised my father. He was like, you what? <laughs> he said, since you were you know, all you wanted, and uh, now they got it, and you're like, huh? Uh, there was a bottle of Maalox in my desk drawer. Be careful what you wish for. It was a particularly stressful place. Imagineering in general is actually not so Maalox laden, but the lab I was in, oh, John left in the middle. And it was a lot like the Soviet Union. <laughs> it was a little dicey for a while. Uh, but it worked out okay. And if they had said, stay here or never walk in the building again, I would have done it. I would have walked away from tenure. I would have just done it. But they made it easy on me. They said, you can have your cake and eat it too. And I basically become a day a week, day -a -week consultant for Imagineering. And I did that for about 10 years. And that's one of the reasons you should all become professors. <laughs> right? Because you can have your cake and eat it too. Okay. Uh, I went on and consulted on things like Disney Quest, so there was the Virtual Jungle Cruise, and the best interactive experience I think ever done, and Jesse Shell gets the credit for this, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, wonderful at Disney Quest. Um, and so those are my childhood dreams, and you know, that's pretty good. I felt good about that. So then the question becomes, how can I enable the childhood dreams of others? And again, boy am I glad I became a professor. What better place to enable childhood dreams? Eh, maybe working at EA, I don't know, that'd probably be a close second, but, uh, and <laughs> this started in a very concrete realization that I could do this, because a young man named Tommy Burnett, when I was at the University of Virginia, came to me, was interested in joining my research group, and uh, we talked about it, he said, oh, and I have a childhood dream. Well, <laughs> it gets pretty easy to recognize them when they tell you. Uh, <laughs> And I said, yes, Tommy, what is your childhood dream? He said, I want to work on the next Star Wars film. Now, you've got to remember the timing on this. Where is Tommy? Tommy is here today. What year would this have been, your sophomore year? Yeah. Oh. Uh, it's around 1993. Are you, are you breaking anything back there, young man? Okay, all right. So in 1993, and I said to Tommy, you know they're probably not going to make those next movies. <laughs> And he said, no, they are. <laughs> and Tommy worked with me for a number of years as an undergraduate and then as a staff member. And then when I moved to Carnegie Mellon, every single member of my team came from Virginia to Carnegie Mellon, except for Tommy, because he got a better offer. <laughs> and he did indeed work on all three of those films. So Alice. 
uh, is a project that we've worked on for a long, long time. It's a novel way to teach computer programming. Kids make movies and games. The head fake. Again, we're back to the head fakes. Best way to teach somebody something is to have them think they're learning something else. All right? I've done it my whole career. And the head fake here is that they're learning to program, but they just think they're making movies and video games. This thing has already been downloaded well over a million times. There are eight textbooks that have been written about it. 10% of US colleges are using it now. And it's not the good stuff yet. The good stuff is coming in the next version. Okay. Uh, I, like Moses, get to see the promised land, but I won't get to set foot in it. And that's OK, because I can see it. And the vision is clear. Millions of kids having fun while learning something hard. That's pretty cool. I can deal with that as a legacy. The next version is going to come out in 2008. It's going to be teaching the Java language if you want them to know they're learning Java. Otherwise, they'll just think that they're writing movie scripts. Uh, and uh, we're getting the characters from the, P the, the best-selling PC game in history, The Sims. And this is all already working in the lab. So there's no real technological risk. All right, so now the third part of the talk, lessons learned. Now we've talked about my dreams. We've talked about helping other people enable their dreams. Somewhere along the way, there's got to be some aspect of what lets you get to achieve your dreams. First one is the role of parents, mentors, and students. I was blessed to have been born to two incredible people. This is my mother on her 70th birthday. <laughs> I am back here. I have just been lapped. <laughs> this is my dad riding a roller coaster on his 80th birthday. Um, and he points out that you know, he's not only brave, he's talented because he did win that big bear the same day. Uh, my dad was so full of life. Uh, anything with him was an adventure. I don't know what's in that bag, but I know it's cool. Uh, my dad dressed up as Santa Claus, but he also did very, very significant things to help lots of people. Uh, this is a dormitory in Thailand that my mom and dad underwrote. And every year, about uh, 30 students get to go to school who wouldn't have otherwise. This is something my wife and I have also been involved in heavily. And these are the kind of things that I think everybody ought to be doing, helping others. Uh, but the best story I have about my dad is, unfortunately, my dad passed away a little over a year ago. And when we were going through his things, he had fought in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. And when we were going through his things, we found out he had been awarded the Bronze Star for Valor. My mom didn't know it. In 50 years of marriage, it had just never come up. Uh, my mom. Uh, mothers are people who love you even when you pull their hair. Uh, and uh, I have two great mom stories. When I was here studying to get my PhD and I was taking something called the theory qualifier, um, which I can definitively say is the second worst thing in my life after chemotherapy. <laughs> <coughs> and I was complaining to my mother about how hard this test was and how awful it was. And she just leaned over and she patted me on the arm and she said, we know how you feel, honey. And remember, when your father was your age, he was fighting the Germans. <laughs> So my next piece of advice is, you just have to decide if you're a Tigger or you're an Eeyore. I think I'm clear where I stand on the great Tigger-Eeyore debate. Never lose the childlike wonder. It's just too important. It's what drives us. Help others. Uh, Denny Prophet knows more about helping other people. He's forgotten more than I'll ever know. He's taught me, by example, how to run a group, how to care about people. Uh, M.K. Haley, I have a theory that people who come from large families are better people because they just had to learn how to get along. M.K. Haley comes from a family with 20 kids. Yeah, um, unbelievable. And she, she always says, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. When I first got to Imagineering, she was one of the people who dressed me down. And, uh, and she said, I understand you've joined the Aladdin Project. What can you do? And I said, well, I'm a tenured professor of computer science. And she said, well, that's a very nice professor boy, but that's not what I asked. I said, what can you do? Um, and you know, I, I mentioned sort of my, my working class roots. I, uh, um, we keep what is valuable to us, what we cherish. And I've kept my letterman's jacket all these years. I used to li like wearing it in grad school. 
and uh, one of my friends, Jessica Hodgins, would say, why do you wear this letterman's jacket? And I looked around at all the non-athletic guys around me who were much smarter than me, and I said, because I can. <laughs> and uh, so she thought that was a real hoot, so one year she made for me this little Raggedy Randy doll. And, uh, he's, he's got a little letterman's jacket, too. That's uh, my all-time favorite. It's the perfect gift for the egomaniac in your life. Uh, so I've met so many wonderful people along the way. Loyalty is a two-way street. There was a young man named Dennis Cosgrove at the University of Virginia. Uh, and when he was a young man, uh, let's just say things happened. And I found myself talking to a dean. And the dean, no, not that dean. Uh, uh, and anyway, this dean really had it in for Dennis. And I can never figure out why, because Dennis was a fine fellow. But for some reason, this dean really had it in for him. And I ended up basically saying, no, I vouch for Dennis. And the guy says, you're not even tenured yet. And you're telling me you're going to vouch for this sophomore or junior or whatever. I think it was a junior at the time. I said, yeah, I'm going to vouch for him because I believe in him. And the dean said, and I'm going to remember this when your tenure case comes up. And I said, deal. I went back to talk to Dennis. And I said, I would really appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. Um, but loyalty is a two-way street. I mean, that was God knows how many years ago. But that's the same Dennis Cosgrove who's carrying Alice forward. He's been with me all these years. Right? And you know, if we only had one person to send in a space probe to meet an alien species, I'm picking Dennis. <laughs> okay. Never give up. I didn't get into Brown University. It was on the wait list. I called him up. And they eventually decided that it was getting really annoying to have me call every day, so they let me in. Um, <laughs> At Carnegie Mellon, I didn't get into graduate school. Andy had mentored me. He said, go to graduate school. You're going to go to Carnegie Mellon. All my good students go to Carnegie Mellon. And uh, yeah, you know what's coming. Uh, and so he said, you're going to go to Carnegie Mellon, no problem. What he had kind of forgotten was that the difficulty of getting into the top THD program in the country had really gone up. And he also didn't know I was going to tank my GREs because <laughs> he believed in me, which based on my board scores was a really stupid idea. And uh, so I didn't get into Carnegie Mellon. No one knows this till today I'm telling the story. I was declined admission to Carnegie Mellon. And uh, I, I was a bit of an obnoxious little kid. I went into Andy's office, and I dropped the rejection letter on his desk. And I said, I just want you to know what your letter of recommendation goes for at Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> <laughs> and before the letter had hit his desk, his hand was on the phone, and he said, I will fix this. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 I don't want to do it that way. That's not the way I was raised. You know, maybe some other graduate schools will see fit to admit me. <laughs> and he said, look, Carnegie Mellon's where you're going to be. He said, I tell you what, I'll make you a deal. Go visit the other schools, because I did get into all the other schools. He said, go visit the other schools, and if you really don't feel comfortable at any of them, then we'll let you, will you let me call Nico. Nico being Nico Haberman. And I said, OK, deal. I went to the other schools without naming them by name. <coughs> Berkeley, Cornell. Uh, <laughs> they managed to be so unwelcoming that I found myself saying to Andy, you know, I'm going to go get a job. And he said, no, you're not. And he picked up the phone, and he talked in Dutch. <laughs> and he hung up the phone, and he said, Nico says if you're serious, be in his office tomorrow morning at 8 AM. And for those of you who know Nico, <laughs> this is really scary. <laughs> so I'm in Nico Hopperman's office the next morning at 8 AM. And he's talking with me. And frankly, I don't think he's that keen on this meeting. <laughs> I don't think he's that keen at all. And he says, um, Randy, uh, why are we here? And um, I said, because Andy phoned you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, since you admitted me, I have won a fellowship. The Office of, Naval, Office of Naval Research is a very prestigious fellowship. I've won this fellowship, and that wasn't in my file when I applied. And Nico said, a fellowship, money, we have plenty of money. That was back then. <laughs> uh, and he said, we have plenty of money. Why do you think having a fellowship makes any difference to us? And he looked at me. There are moments that change your life. And 10 years later, if you know, in retrospect, it was one of those moments, you're blessed. But to know it at the moment 
with Nico staring through your soul. <laughs> and I said, I didn't mean to imply anything about the money. It's just that it was an honor. There were only 15 given nationwide. And I did think it was an honor that would be something that would be meritorious. And I apologize if that was presumptuous. And he smiled. <laughs> and that was good. So how do you get people to help you? You can't get there alone. People have to help you. And I do believe in karma. I believe in paybacks. You get people to help you by telling the truth, being earnest. I'll take an earnest person over a hip person every day, because hip is short term. Earnest is long term. Apologize when you screw up. And focus on other people, not on yourself. Remember brick walls let us show our dedication. They are there to separate us from the people who don't really want to achieve their childhood dreams. Don't bail. The best of the gold is at the bottom of barrels of crap. What Steve, <laughs> what Steve didn't tell you was the big sabbatical at EA. I'd been there for 48 hours, and they, they loved the ETC. We were the best. We were the favorites. And then uh, somebody else pulled me aside and said, oh, by the way, um, we're about to give $8 million to USC to build a program just like yours, and we're hoping you can help them get it off the ground. <laughs> and then Steve came along and said, they said, what, oh, God. <laughs> And, and to quote a famous man, I will fix this. <laughs> and he did. Steve has been an incredible partner. And we have a great relationship, personal and professional. Uh, and he has certainly been point man on, on getting a gaming asset to help teach millions of kids. And uh, you know, that's just incredible. But uh, you know, it certainly would have been reasonable for me to leave 48 hours into that sabbatical. But it wouldn't have been the right thing to do. And when you do the right thing, Good stuff has a way of happening. Uh, get a feedback loop and listen to it. Your feedback loop can be this dorky spreadsheet thing I did, or it can just be one great man who tells you what you need to hear. The hard part is the listening to it. Anybody can get chewed out. Right? It's the rare person who says, oh my god, you're right, as opposed to, no, wait, the real reason is, right? we've all heard that. When people give you feedback, cherish it and use it. Show gratitude. When I got tenure, I took all of my research team down to Disney World for a week. And one of the other professors at Virginia said, how can you do that? I said, these people just busted their ass and got me the best job in the world for life. How could I not do that? Right? Uh, don't complain, just work harder. Right, it's a picture of Jackie Robinson. It was in his contract not to complain, even when the fans spit on him. Right? Uh, be good at something, it makes you valuable. Work hard. People, I got tenure a year early, as Steve mentioned. Junior faculty members used to say to me, wow, you got tenure early. What's your secret? I said, it's pretty simple. Call me any Friday night in my office at 10 o'clock, and I'll tell you. <laughs> Find the best in everybody. One of the things that John Snotty, as I said, told me is that uh, you might have to wait a long time, sometimes years, but people will show you their good side. Just keep waiting, no matter how long it takes. No one is all evil. Everybody has a good side. Just keep waiting. It will come out. And be prepared. Luck is truly where preparation meets opportunity. So today's talk was about my childhood dreams, enabling the dreams of others, and some lessons learned. But did you figure out the head fake? It's not about how to achieve your dreams. It's about how to lead your life. If you lead your life the right way, the karma will take care of itself. The dreams will come to you. Have you figured out the second head fake? <laughs> Talk's not for you. It's for my kids. Thank you all. Good night.